Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone welcome to the course on medical biomaterials um, today we are going to talk about the various analytical tools that are used in uh, area of uh, biomaterial research and lot of tools are being used. So, we are going to spend uh, quite some time uh, uh, in this particular topic. So, if you look at uh, the biomaterials it is highly interdisciplinary in nature. We have uh, materials expertise uh, that means uh, metals and uh, ceramics and so on. So, maybe a metallurgist or a material scientist we have a polymer expertise that means a polymer chemist or a polymer technologist we need uh, experts from chemistry um, organic chemists then we need experts from biochemistry who will doing a lot of uh, um, biochemistry assays then we need expertise from biology who will look at uh, um, immune responses blood responses and so on then we need uh, support from engineering um, support from engineering uh, who will be designing material um, and then uh, all these expertise join together and which leads to the a particular biomaterial. Okay. Uh, we also will of course need at a later point of time uh, uh, clinicians, medical practitioners, surgeons and so on if uh, you are going to take your biomaterial further down um, into the final market. So, because of uh, being an interdisciplinary field the instruments the tools that are used for analyzing uh, the material uh, are wide and vast. So, it is not possible for one type of expert to comprehend all these, uh, but we need expertise from various disciplines as you can see from here. Okay. So, what are the tools used in biomaterial research? Okay, quite a lot. Okay, you want to see the morphological changes more like physical changes. We want to look at uh, whether the material has swollen, um, whether it is shrunk or there is a deformation of the material because it is uh, in um, contact with the body fluids maybe for a short duration or long duration. So, we need to carry out those type of tests. Then um, uh, we need to go into scanning electron microscope uh, to look at uh, the morphological changes in micron layer level. We may have to go to atomic force microscope to look at it in nano layer level. So, we there is a lot of uh, tools that are being used if you are looking at uh, morphological changes. Uh, we will spend more time on the scanning electron uh, microscope and atomic force microscope later as we go along. Um, then we are looking at weight loss. Suppose there is a degradation of the material or resorption you would like to see whether the material has lost its weight. If it is a drug delivery system you want the material to actually lose weight um, due to uh, bioresorption. Okay. Um, then there are going to be a lot of surface changes on the material. Okay. Material uh, may lose uh, uh, its hydrophobic or hydrophilic nature. Um, it may the material may lose uh, its surface energy or gain surface energy. The material may become rough because uh, of uh, being uh, present inside the body fluid if there is flow uh, of blood or if there is a flow of urine they may become rough. Is that going to have any effect? So, we need to study that. Uh, next comes changes in mechanical properties. Okay. If you are using materials especially in the bone or in the knee or where load bearing I would like to know the stress strain changes. Um, is there a change in their flexural strength? If you are using it as a diaphragm valves and so on and so on. So, there are mechanical properties you need to uh, understand changes in the mechanical properties you need to understand. Uh, then comes crystallinity has the material become more crystalline or the material from crystallinity has become more amorphous because of the crystallinity changes the degradation pattern may change uh, some of the mechanical properties may change. So, we would like to know whether there is changes in crystallinity sometimes when the material becomes amorphous it may even uh, solubilize the polymer crystalline polymer may be insoluble whereas uh, when it becomes an amorphous polymer it may become soluble. So, we need to understand the crystallinity. Then comes uh, thermal changes. Okay. Uh, 
has uh, the material changes changed its face okay from one face to another so there are uh, instruments like differential scanning calorimetry uh, thermal gravimetry and so on so we can find out the thermal changes uh, of course, in return they are all connected with crystallinity, so we can study the material especially if they are polymeric in nature. Then molecular weight changes, if it is a polymer I would like to know whether the um, has it degraded, um, has it become oligo more oligomeric in nature, okay. so we can determine viscosity average molecular weight or number average molecular weight or weight average molecular weight. Okay. So, there are many tools like gel permeation, chromatography mass spectrometry which is very useful uh, to determine the mass okay, of the material and suppose if uh, uh, macromolecules are leaching out or if uh, solvents are leaching out we can find out the molecular weight using the mass spectrometer. Different types of mass spectrometry is there we are going to spend time something like MALDI, MSMS that is mass spec mass spec, um, LCMS which can separate the various components using the liquid chromatograph then the mass spec um, so on actually. Then we can look at lot of changes in surface chemistry this is a chemical approach um, because as the material is inside the body it may get um, say hydrolyzed it may get reduced, it may get oxidized, it may get uh, um, attacked by reactive oxygen species. So, there could be a lot of functional groups, new functional groups created, old functional groups might have disappeared. Okay. So, I would like to understand that there are many tools there like infrared spectroscopy, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, UV visible, Raman spectroscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Uh, time of flight sims okay, surface uh, okay, secondary ion this is called a secondary ion mass spec time of flight secondary ion mass spec. So, if you are bombarding a surface with the electrons the ions that are produced they are called secondary ions. So, try to characterize them. So, you see lot of these tools physical chemical prop changes that are happening to your bi biomaterial surface changes bulk changes all these. Now, in addition we need to understand the biological changes that are happening. We need to know has the uh, polymer or material solid material like metals or inorganic has acquired uh, attached biofilm. Okay. So, I need to find out um, how many colonies are present in the biofilm, how many live, live cells vis a vis dead cells. I need to know how much protein is attached in the biofilm, how much carbohydrate is attached. Okay, all these quantities I need to know. In addition, I can perform the Fourier transform infrared to see what are the surface functional grooves that has happened there. I can use Raman spectroscopy. So, if I want to study the bacterial biofilm, that means the biofilm that is uh, attached on the surface of the material, be it a polymer, be it a metal or a ceramic, I may have to do all these various characterization. Um, then, <coughs> I need to know whether the material is cytotoxic to uh, animal cells. Okay. So, if it is going to be cytotoxic then uh, we do not want to use that material. So, we mean to say uh, we need to see how much live cells are present after say 24 hours after 48 hours okay. what is the percentage of dead cells. Okay. I need to do that. So, there are some assays for that. Then I want to know how the cells are growing and if I am using this material as a scaffold for growing cells <coughs> are the cells settling down and then slowly differentiating. Uh, so, I need to study that. Then I need to know the hemocompatibility that means, uh, if it is a blood contacting device is the material going to be very toxic to the blood. Will it uh, um, create responses, so that the blood starts clotting on the surface which is very very dangerous. Okay. So, you see a um, lot of biological studies I need to look at, I need to look at bacterial biofilm related. I need to look at whether the material is uh, cytotoxic to the um, animal cells, uh, whether they induce any re response and then are they problematic to the blood, the blood plasma, blood protein and other various components of the blood. Uh, are, am I going to have coagulation or I am going to have any other uh, um, problems related to the blood compatibility. So, you see we need to have facilities for carrying out physical uh, parameter study, the chemical parameter study and biological parameter study. So, uh, it becomes very difficult for one maybe lab to have all these facilities. 
So sometimes they may have to do it uh, in collaboration with other groups. Okay, I might have covered many of them, but not all of them. Okay. Okay. Now we will look at uh, many of them slightly more in detail because, uh, as I said, that uh, they have a lot of uh, importance. Okay. So we look at it. For example, I may have a, a drug delivery system. I want to know how it gets swollen as a function of time because of ingress of water. So, as the water starts going inside, uh, say the polymeric material will start swelling. Um, so, there could be hydrolysis taking place, the polymer may be degrading either as a bulk or surface erosion as I said. Um, so, whatever is inside uh, will get released, okay, whatever is encapsulated. So, I want to study how the swelling takes place as a function of time. Okay. So, it may follow a graph like this. So, as a function of time it may go up and then may flatten out. <clears throat> so, what do you do? You measure the um, weight as a function of time okay, and then uh, you plot it. Now, if the polymeric material also starts degrading, so after some time the weight may start going down. So, if that happens you can be sure that may be the material itself is degrading. So, if the, uh, the swelling rate is faster than the degradation rate then of course, you will not see any uh, degradation. So, you will not see decrease in weight, but uh, if, we if the degradation also starts taking place then the weight may go up and start decreasing. Okay. So, with the help of uh, a very simple set of um, uh, physical data collection we will be able to understand the mechanism of uh, swelling of uh, polymeric system. Okay. Um, so, if the material is losing weight, so you may end up having uh, a relationship like this, you know, the weight loss. Um, as a function of time, um, it will be going down maybe as a first order or maybe as a half order and so on actually. Again this data is very useful especially if you are looking at drug delivery systems. Okay. Okay, then comes uh, surface wetting properties. This is extremely important because uh, you want hydrophilic material, hydrophobic material sometimes uh, uh, cause uh, um, bacterial attachment, sometimes cause uh, uh, cytotoxicity, hydrophilic materials are always preferred in such situations. Okay. So, the balance of hydrophilicity versus hydrophobicity is very important. Okay. So, for example, look at this, this is a water droplet on a surface. So, the material of course, is highly hydrophobic that is why um, the material is not, the water is not spreading. So, the more hydrophilic it is water will spread out, more hydrophobic it is water will um, not spread out. Okay. So, that is a very good measure of knowing the hydrophobic hydrophilic nature of the material. For example, there are uh, instruments uh, that is called a goniometer. Okay, it measures the contact angle a water droplet makes with the surface. Okay. So, look at this. So, a drop water droplet is uh, slowly placed on a surface. Okay, this is a surface, this is a needle which puts in a water. Okay, uh, the water falls in. So, then what do you do? Uh, angle that is made is measured okay, and from the angle one can uh, tell whether the surface is hydrophilic or whether the surface is hydrophobic. Okay. Then um, we can also calculate surface energy, uh, so many things. For example, uh, you can see water droplet spreads very well here. Okay. So, of course, the material is very, very hydrophilic whereas here uh, as you can see the water droplet uh, is is here like this. Okay. So, this is uh, hydrophobic relatively hydrophobic whereas in the previous picture I showed you this must be a extremely hydrophobic surface because water just sits on it, it is not spreading at all. Okay. So, so, this is relatively hydrophobic this is very very hydrophilic. So, the contact angle as we can see this is the angle uh, will be very less. So, lesser the angle we can say the material is hydrophilic. 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees whereas, 70, 80, 90 and so on we can call it hydrophobic surface. So, it is very important uh, to un, uh, note this. So, whenever you design a biomaterial and you pre prepare you need to check the contact angle of the material okay, and tell whether the material is hydrophilic or hydrophobic. As I said hydrophilic material have high surface energy. So, um, attachment of bacteria is very poor and also um, the animal cells uh, um, uh, 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 do, not have, uh, uh, do not have a toxicity towards uh, hydrophilic material. Whereas, hydrophobic material the attachment of uh, bacteria also will be very high 
um, the uh, animal cells could be uh, toxic to that uh, material okay, or the material could be toxic uh, to the animal cells. Okay. Uh, so, uh, if you have a hydrophobic surface generally um, try to modify the surface hydrophilic you may add uh, functional groups like OH or NH uh, uh, and so on so that material is made more hydrophobic. So, uh, goniometer is a very powerful uh, tool uh, to measure the um, contact angle uh, a water droplet makes on a, a surface of a um, biomaterial. Okay. Now, um, let us look at it microscopes. Microscopes are uh, very, very important. We have light microscope, we have electron microscope, we have atomic force microscope. Atomic force we call it AFM. Okay. Everybody knows light microscope. This is the uh, normally we see under uh, light. Okay. Um, the of course, uh, the magnification is very limited in light microscope, maybe 100 x using oil. So, if I want to see further, if I want to see biofilms, uh, if I want to see bacteria, I may go have to go for scanning electron microscope. If I want to look at nanoparticles, I may go to transmission electron microscope or even atomic force microscope. Okay. So, depending upon what you want to do, you choose different microscope. Okay. So, if you are looking at uh, live dead cells using some uh, fluorescent dyes, I may stop with light microscope. If I want to look at bacteria, biofilms, um, I may have to go to scanning electron and so on actually. Okay. So, these are the various categories of uh, microscope, the light microscope, electron microscope and atomic force. So, I can see in nano scale 1 nanometer with AFM, even with TEM I can see between 1 and 5 nanometer, uh, whereas SCM I can see 100 nanometer. Light maybe uh, it could be uh, millimeter going right up to uh, micrometer. Okay. So, this is what is microscope and microscopes are widely used um, in uh, uh, various areas of uh, uh, biology and especially the area of uh, biomaterials, it is widely used. Okay. Okay. Uh, Let us look at each one of them little bit in more detail, the scanning electron microscope. What is the scanning electron microscope? So, here a stream of electrons from an electron gun or a source is accelerated ok. So, it is accelerated by using uh, some voltages um, and then there is a magnetic lens. So, it is focused um, this is all done through a positive electric potential because the electrons are negative. So, it is focused through a magnetic lens and then it hits the sample. So, secondary electrons or reflector are back scattered ok. It could be a, um, even photons of characteristic x-rays and light. So, here you have a detector and from the detector you measure it. Okay. So, we have an electron source, a beam is produced, uh, focused, uh, it hits the sample. So, you have back scattering electron, secondary electrons, photons, x-rays all these are produced, uh, it is detected here. So, we can look at uh, samples going right up to 100 or even 50 uh, nanometer scale not below that. Uh, so, for example, this is say a polymeric surface we are looking at approximately 100 nanometer scale. We can look at see uh, rough surface. So, because of uh, being present in a, in a body fluid for a long time, uh, it has acquired roughness. That is called a scanning electron microscope. Okay. Now, with scanning electron microscope, we can also do um, compositional analysis. That means, I can look at the elemental composition. Um, uh, on the surface using an attachment called EDX or EDS that is called energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy. So, we can attach that. Uh, so, a high energy beam of charged particles electrons or protons or x-rays is focused on the surface. Okay. Uh, so, at rest an atom within the sample contains ground state electrons in discrete energy levels or electron shells bound to the nucleus. So, incident beam may excite an electron in an inner shell ejecting it from the shell while creating an electron hole. So, an electron from an outer higher energy shell then fill this hole and this different in energy between the higher energy shell and the lower energy shell is released in the form of an x-ray which is detected that is why it is called energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy. So, what do you do? You um, focus a beam of electrons. Okay. So, it uh, excites um, the electrons 
okay, at the um, innermost shell, ejecting it from the shell. So, it creates an electron hole. So, electron from a outer that is high energy shell fills this hole. Now, this difference in energy is liberated okay, in the form of X-ray. Okay. That X-ray tells you uh, because it is a measure of the difference in energy which is also a measure of the type of element. The number and energy of the X-rays emitted from a specimen is measured by a energy dispersive spectrometer. Okay. This is how you can measure the composition of uh, various elements present on the surface. So, energies of the X-rays are characteristics of the difference in energy between the two shells and the atomic structure of the ele element present. Okay. So, the energy difference is characteristics of the shells of the atomic structure of that element. So, from the energy of X-rays that are liberated, one can uh, tell what type of elements that are present on the surface. Okay. For example, look at this picture. Okay. This is an inorganic salt deposition on a polymer. So, we are looking at magnesium, phosphor, calcium, chlorine, potassium, aluminum, carbon and nitrogen of course. So, uh, this is how a EDX picture looks like, if, like, like this. This is the SEM of that and this is an EDX. So, we are trying to uh, see uh, the salt, what are the elemental composition. We can even get the elemental composition of the salts that are present on the surface of this material. So, we can get both uh, the uh, surface morphology as well as the composition of uh, various uh, elements present on the surface. So, what are the components of this EDX uh, um, excitation source? Of course, electron beam or X-ray, detector, pulse processor and the analyzer. So, EDX is very important. So, generally they have an attachment with the SEM. So, we can look at one area uh, of the biomaterial surface, um, either a surface modified or after being implanted, explanted. Uh, then we, we want to know what are the elements that are present. We perform the EDX and we get uh, uh, these type of uh, um, spectrum. Then from here we can tell the composition as well. So, that gives you a nice idea about the composition. So, with the respect to control, we can say what changes have happened. For example, uh, this picture as I said is uh, salt deposition on a um, material surface and um, what are the elements that are present in the salt like phosphorus, calcium, potassium, magnesium, chlorine okay? and then oxygen and so on. So, it is very powerful for you. We can get a feeling of the surface morphology as well as the elemental composition. Okay? Now, let us go to transmission electron microscope. It is more uh, um, powerful. We can go up to nano scale. Okay? We can look at the nano particles uh, 10, my, 10 nanometers, 20 nanometers, 5 nanometers and so on. So, it is extremely very good. Um, in a scanning electron microscope, uh, as I uh, showed you, uh, the, uh, the, the, the detector signals come out like this. Okay? So, you will have the electron source and the detector signal on the same uh, side of the sample. Whereas, uh, in a transmission electron microscope, you can see the signal gets transmitted through the sample. So, we detect it on the other side. So, obviously, in a transmission electron microscope, if you want to perform some studies, the sample uh, thickness should be very, very minimal because the signals have to pass through the um, sample. So, here a beam of electrons is transmitted through an ultra thin specimen. So, these electrons uh, interact with these specimens okay? um, and then that gives you some signals which are detected on this side. Otherwise, it is almost this portion is almost same as the scanning electron microscope. Okay? So, this is a picture of uh, nanoparticles um, produced uh, uh, through a, a chemical synthetic uh, procedure and, um, and detected using a transmission electron TEM as we call it. Um, and you can see these are all in nano scale maybe about 20 nanometer spherical particle. So, if you want to see so nicely, we cannot use a scanning electron microscope, we need to use a transmission electron microscope. Okay? Uh, then comes atomic force microscope. Actually, atomic force microscope is not a really uh, a microscope like uh, light or SEM or TEM. Okay? It is very interesting. Um, it measures the changes um, surface roughness for example, um, of a cantilever that moves on the 
uh, surface of the material. So, it is a more like a scanning probe microscopy, okay. it is a probe um, cantilever probe which travels on the surface and the changes uh, in its height due to the roughness is measured through a detector and um, that picture is shown that is what is atomic force microscope. Okay. So, it is not like a light microscope or scanning electron or a um, transmission electron. So, uh, what happens is uh, there is a probe which touches the surface it is a mechanical probe. So, there is a laser uh, which is uh, focused on it. So, as the uh, probe moves uh, because of the roughness of the surface the probe may move up and down uh, which is captured here in photodiode and which is detected. So, this particular um, cantilever moves all across the surface of the sample and it is upward and downward movement is captured and uh, that is a measure of the surface topography or surface changes okay? and this is what the picture is um, and we can get it in nano scale. For example, uh, the surface of a polymer um, which is um, uh, incubated for uh, 2 days uh, in uh, body fluid okay, the roughness that has happened. Okay. So, atomic force microscope we can uh, detect uh, in a nano scale just like T m, but T m is more like a microscope whereas, atomic force microscope is not a microscope it is more like uh, touching the surface and the changes in the surface roughness uh, are captured using a laser okay, which is uh, uh, shown in the form of a pictorial representation as you can see here and that is what it is okay, unlike, unlike a SEM or TEM. But all these tools are used suppose I want to see um, if there is a bactyl attachment uh, on the surface which are in uh, very small level we can see or if there are any nanoparticles uh, embedded on a polymer surface or I can see the uh, whether the nanoparticles are uh, agglomerated or separated from each other. So, all these are can be done with atomic force microscope okay. whereas, transmission electron we can look at uh, um, nanoparticle nano scale um, drug delivery systems the scanning electron microscope we can look at biofilm attachment we can look at bacteria. Uh, we can even look at uh, the uh, biofilm architecture like last class I talked about the architecture of the biofilm are there pores in the biofilm or are they smooth. So, there we can use SEM. So, sometimes we need to combine two three different techniques uh, so that uh, we get uh, a, a very good understanding. So, one technique alone might not be enough. Okay. So, um, what are the differences between all these? Okay. If you look at resolution a normal compound light microscope 500 nanometer TEM will go up to uh, 10 nanometer okay. scanning electron microscope maybe 2 nanometer atomic force 1 nanometer resolution is also like that uh, magnifying power we can go up uh, quite a lot depth of field TEM is moderate scanning electron is high atomic force is also high depth of field for a compound microscope because you are viewing from the top we cannot go very low down. Type of objects we can see living and non living thing with compound microscope um, whereas, with these microscope what happens is with TEM and scanning because we are using electron as a probe um, it should have very high vacuum. Okay. Um, of course, there are now biological based scanning electron microscope where the vacuum levels are not very high, but still uh, we need to have the uh, very high vacuum in TEM and SEM. So, generally we cannot see live we will always see dead bacterial biofilm um, uh, whereas, we can see things live uh, in a compound microscope and also in atomic force microscope because you are not applying vacuum um, in AFM unlike TEM and SEM. Preparation technique um, compound microscope it is very simple scanning electron is simple whereas, TEM and atomic force we need to have a very skilled operation. Preparation thickness okay. uh, compound microscope we can have very thick uh, TEM we can go down to very thin surfaces um, other two surf uh, scanning and atomic we can have uh, reasonably um, thin or thick surfaces. Okay. Specimen mounting uh, compound microscope has to be on a glass slide um, TEM may be on thin films on copper grids scanning can be aluminum or carbon and so on. Uh, field of view 
compound it is large, transmission is limited, scanning large, atomic force is also very limited. Uh, source of radiation, compound microscope we are using a light, uh, TEM we are using electrons, scanning also we are using electrons, atomic force we are using force. Medium, uh, compound microscope is air, TEM is vacuum, scanning is vacuum, atomic force air or liquid. The nature of lens, we have glass here, we have uh, one electrostatic plus a few EM lenses, electromagnetic lenses they are called. In atomic force, we have laser, diode and few emission lenses. Focusing, compound microscope, it is mechanical, uh, TEM in the, we have uh, lens coil, elect current and voltage. Um, whereas, in atomic force, it is mechanical forces. Magnification, changing objectives, current in the projector lens, current, okay. Uh, so, we are using a, a voltage and current in that. Specimen contrast due to light, light absorption, uh, TEM uh, and SEM, it is because of electron scattering, whereas atomic force, it becomes atom scattering. So, we see a lot of difference between uh, these four type of microscopy, a uh, compound, scanning, uh, TEM and atomic force microscopy, okay. So, each of them have their uh, own advantages, disadvantages. Uh, we use each of them at different levels for different uh, reasons, okay. Sometimes we combine uh, two of them together um, so that we get uh, quite a lot of, lot of knowledge. So, uh, as I mentioned that uh, uh, you can look at uh, surface morphology, we can look at size, we can look at agglomeration, uh, with EDX we can look at even elemental composition, uh, that means what are the type of elements that are present on the surface of the material. So, uh, all these are uh, morphological based studies, okay. Uh, these are not uh, depth based studies, that means we do not look at the changes in the bulk, but more from the surface layers, okay. It could be few microns uh, depth only. Okay. Thank you very much and we will continue more in the next class.